Hi, welcome. I'm Michelle Redman, and this is a special edition of Soul Talk brought to you by the, da the Denton Black Film Festival. And we have a really special guest uh, for our conversation today. Uh, she's the producer, writer, and director of a documentary, a really juicy jock documentary called Mr. Soul. And I want to welcome Melissa Hayslip. Melissa? Hi, how are you? Your resume is like so big and you've done so oh. much. It's really pretty incredible. Um, and the word soul, the show is called Soul Talk. Your documentary is Mr. Soul about the show Soul with exclamation points. So soul is a really big deal in your life, wouldn't you say, for quite some time? Quite some time, and I love the synergy here with the name of the show, too, Soul Talk. I think it's the most important thing, and especially right now when we're all sort yeah. of trying to find ourselves in this very challenging time. Very um, challenging, yeah. Exactly, especially for people of color, as, you know, we, we're getting the raw end of the deal here with the pandemic and everything, and, you know, I want to always start by saying, you know, honoring those who we've lost, and, of course, mm -hmm. they are struggling. I think that's very important because it's hard to find – permission to celebrate at the same time. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that, that it, I understand it's a difficult time. And I hope that talking about this film and also, you know, celebrating our culture will give us all a really good feeling about um, looking to the future and hoping for a brighter future for all of us, especially. Yeah, there have been days where I'm thinking apocalypse, uh, anyway. Um, so what you said was so uh, key, celebration. The program Soul that this documentary is about is really a celebration, and I'll and I'll I'll break that down in just a second. But first, the um, the the main character, so to speak, is your uncle Ellis Hayslip, and of all the people you can think of hosting a show that had this much presence and this much uh, importance, he would not have been my first choice. Um, because he looks so small and so um, just like a wisp of a man, but he was really powerful in how he asked questions, how he made people comfortable, and also the content. So, what was he like for you in real life? You know, as a as a family man, as a as as a as a member of your family. You know, very much the way you described him, Ellis Hayslip was very enigmatic. Oh. He was not. Uh, a normal kind of guy from the 50s, 60s, you know, growing up with him was really exciting because I knew that Ellis Hazlip had this sort of entree into the culture and yeah. was all about pushing the culture forward is what we would say now. Yeah. He was had a love affair with black culture and black people. And his priority was always giving voice to the voiceless, creating mm -hmm. a platform for African-Americans. And so, the special thing about his show Soul, which ran from 1968 to 1973, yeah. is that it was not only was it a vehicle for African-American artistry, but it was a platform for political expression and the fight for social justice. So that was the model we knew in terms yeah, of- there's no, other, there's no other show like it since and during its time. I mean, it was, it was just amazing because for the first time you see black culture, uh, black, the, the power of black culture, whether it be dance or poetry, uh, certainly singing, um, gosh, I mean, you name it, uh, it was there. It Whatever black power as a culture could be um, demonstrated, he had it on the show or in the interviews with authors. Absolutely, and I think also it was very important for him to show the spectrum and to show an array of stars, not just the people that we knew, but introducing um, artists who had not been seen before, had not been heard before. And remember, this is on the heels of the civil rights movement too. Yeah. So we, yeah. we, are, we move freely now for the most part, um, and we didn't then. And so this notion of expanding this idea of what black culture was, and also saying that black art is significant, that yeah. jazz music is an art form. And he wasn't trying to justify these things. That's what was interesting. He was saying, oh no, it already exists. Yeah, it already exists. Black it's excellence has always been that. Yeah. 
right? And so that was a different type okay. of approach. Well, let's say, yeah. let me start off by uh, asking you, let me interrupt for a second, because I want to um, really dig into this. Um, you start off with some incredible archival footage. So what I'd love to know, and now, of course, uh, I'm older than you. Don't even uh, uh, argue about it. I am. Um, so, uh, so I related to, it's like, you know, I was a, as a little girl, you know, seeing uh, people being fire hosed in oh. civil rights protests, um, aggressive dogs attacking, you know, just the very thing that John Lewis um, mm -hmm. recently passed, talked about LBJ signing the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Bill. My question as a filmmaker, how long did it take you to get those elements together? How long did it take you to even do this project? Well, it took a long time to get those elements together and it took 10 years to get the film together. So that gives me an idea. Wow. So a long time. But what was really important and what was sort of the impetus behind not just the, the length of time, but also the specificity of what we were showing yeah. was this notion that this is a very long, uh, a very important span of events. Mm -hmm. It's also a critical moment in history that hasn't really been fully examined in terms right. of the birth of diversity in television and inclusion, but also in terms of this idea of sort of reinventing ourselves on this American landscape and what that meant culturally and how culture creates change and becomes a shift for change and can change the perceptions of African Americans in the country. And that's what Seoul tried to do. And so in order to show what Seoul was interrupting, mm -hmm. we had to start the film with, and really clearly situate you in what, what was happening in the era, what was the zeitgeist, if you will, yeah. that would have created an opportunity for Seoul to emerge, right? So we have the, the um, the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. literally maybe let's see all this like four months prior. Wow! The, the show came on in September the eighth, nineteen sixty-eight, and, and he was uh, murdered on um, April fourth. And so that's not a big span of time. No. And we all know what happened in the country. You know, the country erupted. And then oh, you know, everything, yeah. everyone was pushing back. I don't want to call it riots, but people were having oh, uprisings. Well, and and yeah. so, and in June, uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. So you had that exactly. back to back. Yeah, and it was an assault on any type of liberal uh, uh, representation and expression. And up until that point, there wasn't a lot of freedom of expression as well. And so this idea that there was this burgeoning culture happening and that people were pushing back against this negative stereotype uh, that was being portrayed in the media, especially. And media had been weaponized, really, for the to push against and to promote the inhumanity of African Americans and people of color. And Ellis Hazel said, no, that's not who we are. That's not what we represent. I'm going to show you the full spectrum. Well, let's, culture and let's, the complexity of that. Without further ado, let's take a look at the trailer so that people can start to salivate about this incredible documentary. Uh, so let's watch that. I'm Ellis Hayes, this one. Welcome to Soul. James Baldwin. Earth, Wind & Fire. Stevie Wonder, Nikki Giovanni. Harry Belafonte. Al Green. Yo, this is every day. Can you imagine what Soul would have been like for a 20-year run? Los Angeles, Detroit, Newark, cities across the country were erupting. There were so few positive African-American images on television. We needed to reimagine ourselves on this American landscape. Got any ideas, fellas? Live and in color from New York City, Soul. I'm Ellis Hayes, the producer of Soul, and we are happy to have you with us this evening. Ellis was a gardener, and he cultivated all of these people. Voices speaking to the problems of our time. Ellis said, if we're going to do something for the black community, it's got to be a lot deeper, jazzier, even more controversial. It's about time I hear something besides blondes have more fun. <laughs> Ellis already knew that black culture led, didn't pull. Baby. Be still, peace, be still. revolutionary 
the conversations he had between writers and poets. Of course you can lie to me. Treat me the same way you would treat him. I can't treat you. You must. Treat. You grin at him all day long. You come on when I catch up because I love you. I get least of you. Fake it with me. I asked him, why are you having Rasan Roland Kirk on? He said, because he's crazy. That program was so beyond its time that it was in time. Soul was giving TV exposure to activist revolutionaries. They want me to go to Vietnam to shoot some black folks that never lynched me, never called me nigga. You're so much more than Blacks all around the country say, yes. Stay high, sucker chump. You could do anything you wanted. The FBI was very, very disturbed by that. How did we get the I said, Ellis, this is a piece of history. Let's fight for it. There exists, as far as I know, no TV program that deals with my culture so completely, so freely, and so beautifully. There is nothing, nothing we cannot do. Black seeds keep on growing. There's nothing but evolution in my soul. You've got to be bursting with pride. I mean, that is such an amazing accomplishment that you bring to uh, film goers this incredible story about he happened to be your uncle, but whether he was your uncle or not, this incredible program that just, I mean, it changed that part or that time in the world and it just sort of had a ripple effect. So I've got to ask you, Melissa, who would be your ideal consumer of this content? Right now? Yeah. You know, I think it could serve a lot of purposes. And ironically, you know, Soul at the time was a bridge because imagine you had basically four networks. Well, yeah. you had CBS, NBC, and ABC, and then you had PBS. So there weren't a lot of options no, for no. what you could actually see and what was available to you. And that's what we do in the beginning of the film. We really set up what, what was the TV landscape, and it was pretty much all one color. Ironically, at the at the emergence of color television, here come the folks, you know. And so I, <laughs> I just wanted to show that to show how important and how revolutionary it was that Ellis Hazel had the audacity to say, we have a place on television too, and why not make the world look like it really does? Now, mind you, the show itself wasn't integrated, but he was integrating television just by it existing. And so I think even today, it has really universal appeal. Number one, you've got all these amazing artists that are part of all of our lives and all of our soundtracks, right? From CB Wonder, Earth, Wind, Fire. Um, Ashford and Simpson. Ashford and Simpson. Yeah. Al Green. Al Green. I mean, you know, <laughs> and so there's something really nostalgic about that. And to be able to look back and see, it's almost like a time capsule. And you get to see them in their prime when they were hungry and unfiltered and a little not really self-conscious not doing it for press not clout chasing none of that you know and so it's it's really almost too good to be true you know and i like to say this is the greatest show you never heard of for those who yeah. haven't heard of it but on I, the other hand it's very real and it's not I asking the, friends have you heard of this show and they're like what? And I said, how, how did we miss this? I know. You know I've, I've been thinking about that. And I think it has a lot to do with the position of the show when it aired between 68 and 73. And that was right before everything happened that kind of opened up on television. One of the directors of the show is Stan Lathan, who's super famous now, of course, as a producer, director, and his daughter as well is Sanaa Lathan, the actress. The actress, and, yeah. Um, Stan was responsible for some of the greatest episodes of Soul, the Stevie Wonder episode, the, uh, the um, Stevie Wonder and Wonder Love, of course, all of the great music and dance, the, the, uh, the Al Green shows, and Earth, Wind, Fire. And he just had a beautiful eye. And right after he left Soul, he went to Hollywood and started you know, directing Sanford and Son. And like, the rest was history. But before the 70s, there really wasn't a place for black culture on television. Certainly not in a, you know, in a way that was unapologetically black. That really wasn't trying to cover itself up or pretty itself up and just yeah. being really like a mirror. Yeah, <clears throat> a mirror is a perfect description. Yeah. But let me just take a sidestep and talk about you a little bit. Oh, okay. 
people have a, 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 a better idea that I'm talking to a rock star. Aww. So yeah, you, you are. Uh, so you attended Yale, a little Ivy League, throw that in. But okay. born in Boston and you were raised in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. Jing, I mean, oh my gosh. Um, that was a, a kind of a fluke because my father had this really great opportunity. He was also a pioneer, but in education. And it, it was uh, a time when the Virgin Islands was just starting to emerge as a hotspot, not just for tourism, but really finding itself. And he became the commissioner of education under the first governor that was elected by the people. You know, the people yeah. probably know St. Thomas, St. John, St. Croix. Yeah. At the time, uh, right before he came there, uh, they weren't able to actually vote. And so everything was changing and he wanted to bring sort of a stateside mentality and idea of education and improvements to the islands. So we left New York, where I, where I was very happy <laughs> uh, growing up as a kid. Uh, we were in St. Thomas and I had this extraordinary um, childhood, we would come back and forth because we, we were not actually West Indian. So we would come back and forth with our family to the States. But just having that upbringing was very unique. It gave me such an appreciation. Of Real more, more cultural. Area. More cultural and being comfortable being black around people, everyone who's black. And I was yeah. like, this is great. I didn't even think twice about it. You know, it really. I'm, I'm going to keep going with your, yeah. some of your credits. Um, you were artist in residence at the National Black Programming Consortium. Now it's called Black Public Media. They're like, oh. they're like the watchdogs for uh, diversity in television. They are attached to public media, making sure okay. that there's enough diversity and that black directors and content producers are getting their work on there as equally as some of the others. And you were the artist in residence for that. Yeah, it was really great. And they are the first people to support my film. They gave us research and development money as a grant. And uh, they have a great platform. Check them out at Black Public Media. Um, they do wonderful things. And they're really supportive of black and brown producers, directors, and content makers. And that is very rare. And so I have to give them a shout out. Well, well kudos for that. Also, we're both members of PGA, the Producers Guild Association. And you uh, attended diversity workshops with PGA that's based out of LA. Yeah, and I actually workshopped uh, Mr. Soul in there. So I have a lot yeah. of friends from the PGA, absolutely. That was a great program uh, because when you're starting out with an idea and you haven't really been around professionals in that way, it really helped mold me. I learned how to pitch, how to write pitches and how to really present myself as a professional. You know, Joining the industry, sometimes you get bogged down in the art that you're creating and you forget that there's this whole other hat that you have to wear as a producer and that was really helpful yeah if you don't talk the language they won't listen or you will never get absolutely the door. uh also i want i need to <laughs> ask you to tell the story the name of your production company oh. <laughs> is shoes in the bed productions shoes <laughs> in the bed and it's a great story that i think your is it an uncle or your dad yeah, yeah. Tells a story about why, what, where, what, the the genesis of that. So, if you would, if you would uh, tell our audience, why is your production company called Shoes in the Bed? Uh, well, you know, it's a funny story that I learned while I was shooting Mr. Soul, and I was interviewing my dad, and we talked about how Ellis would come home from Elvis Hayslip would come home from being in New York or some exotic place back to D.C. Uh, they were in Deanwood, which is a, a historically black neighborhood there, and uh, where Marvin Gaye grew up, by the way. Oh. And uh, so Deanwood. And so he would come home and he would get in bed with his shoes on, pull the covers all the way up to his neck, and wait for my grandmother to come home. And my grandmother was pristine, you know. <laughs> She was literally cleaning floors at the Pentagon. That was her job, very respectable yeah. job, very hardworking woman. Yeah. And she basically spent her time between the Pentagon and the church. And when she came home and found him in her bed, which was her inner sanctorum, <laughs> she would say, LSB, is that you in my bed, boy? Do you have your shoes on? Oh, and he would say, yes, Aunt Nelly, I may have to go somewhere, so I need to be ready. And, and just make her laugh. And she that is great. 
And yeah. this idea of you do something that you're not supposed to do, but you do it anyway. And you make people laugh and you entertain them and everything turns out in the end. And when I heard the story, I was like, hmm. that is exactly what I'm doing. There you go. And I've taken on a huge project that, you know, culturally, historically, musically is very, very ambitious. And everyone said, you should never do that. It's going to be too hard. The music will never clear it. It's going to be too difficult, you know. And I said, but I have to tell the story. It's, wow. it's our story. It's, it's black history. It's black culture. And, and it's not about me, but it's about us as a people. And um, I thought that that's a perfect parallel for my company, you know, because so many people said, you're never going to be able to pull that off. You're not going to raise money, you know. And I thought, yeah, it's choosing event productions. Let's go ahead and do that thing with us. Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you like me now? Um, and not not to brag or anything, but like, you should. It was it was that almost you know that reinforcement that you need. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. I'll show you. Yeah. Um, last thing uh, about your credits because there are too many, but you danced with Gregory Hines and oh oh yeah, some guy named Mikhail Barishnikov. Oh, okay, on Broadway. Oh, yeah, I got it down here. Yeah, so, that was Act One. So mm -hmm. I did come from a theatrical background. I trained my whole life as a professional dancer and um, studied, was on scholarship at Ailey and also um, Dancer of Harlem. So that was my upbringing. And I moved into Broadway and did some performing and lots of shows on Broadway and around the world. And I got to dance with Gregory, who was my idol. And uh, I also was tap dancer, so that was a big part of my, my career as well. So that was, filmmaking is an act, too. Yeah, just on the side, Mikhail and Gregory. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now tell me about Christopher Lucas. He was the co-creator of the show Soul. Mm -hmm. um, Christopher Lucas, formerly informally known as Kit. Oh, um, yeah. I was right, right. him last night. He, I like the how, is he so, how is he so woke about all this? He's white and oh, he's white. He's and he's woke AF. I will tell yeah. you, because the thing is, his father and his father-in-law both were in um, were uh, civil rights attorneys, oh. and so he was steeped in this notion of equality and justice. Um, and I think it's. I'm so glad that he was in the right place at the right time. And he had met Ellis, and Ellis had been house sitting for him and taking care of the cat. So they had an intimate friendship yeah. and trust. And Kit Lucas was at Channel 13 WNET, which is the flagship flagship sorry flagship station uh, for PBS in New York. And again, he had this epiphany, realizing you know I, there's no there's no opportunities for black people on our staff to do anything, whether they're producing, yeah. directing, or helping. And so we got to do something about that. And that was in response to the Kerner Commission, and which was in response to right. the uh, uprisings after Martin Luther King was assassinated. And so he was part of the cultural programming and came up with this idea uh, for a Black Tonight show. Yeah. And Ella, Ella said right away, uh uh, no, you know, that's not the model that we need. That's the model that you know, but yeah. that's not what Black people need. We need a show that's much more um, powerful more controversial um, and more, you know, that's not from that white gaze, if you will, but mm -hmm. but an inner truth of black, of black life and the black experience. Well, Melissa, don't you think it was that because Ellis didn't try to make it about him? Right. It, the show was about the really content, content driven, as opposed to let's say a Johnny Carson who was, Oh yeah, it was his vehicle. It was him, and 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 all about him as far as that's concerned, and and whether or not you got along with Johnny Ellis wasn't like that. He no, really he wasn't. The what, I think what's interesting too is that he was Ellis Hayslip was a reluctant host in the beginning. Yeah. He didn't want his personality or his lack of uh, experience as an on camera sort of talent to get in the way of all the extraordinary talent that he knew. He'd always been behind the scenes. You know, he was the first person to produce the Amen Corner, which is the mm. music play by uh, by James Baldwin. And he was friends with Baldwin. And he had taken the taken it to Europe 
and done a European tour in 1965. And he worked in Harlem with Vinette Carroll, and he was sort of working with the legal ensemble company and was aware of all this talented, you know, this black talent that existed but didn't really have a place to go outside of theater uh, because, you know, Jim Crow was really prohibitive in terms of jobs and opportunities. So he wanted to push all of that forward and give more opportunities to artists. And that, I think that was the impetus to create Soul, to have a place, sort of a place for black love, black intellect, black music, black culture. And the audience. And black descent even. And, black and the, black. Audience, the audience was, was pretty um, close to the stage. They were sitting around and from what I saw, primarily, if not exclusively black, and there was a comfort level, just sort of like relax in the shoulders. This is, I can relax to this, or this is, this is, this is my, my culture. This is my stuff. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that environment was so important. And um, just as an example, <laughs> uh, Marie, uh, Anna Maria Horsford, who many people know as an actress, um, she was on Amen, for example, in a lot of shows and TV shows. She started out at Channel 13 as a temp, and Ellis found her at the front desk and said, oh, no, 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 what do you really want to do? And she said, I want to be an actress. He said, come with me. Really? And he invited her to be on the team as an associate producer, and she became one of the, like, the second black associate producer of all time. That is and amazing. gave her opportunities to act on the show, et cetera. And that was really very, very important to put forward opportunities for black women in space where you wouldn't see them normally, on crews, for example, or yeah. sitting down and interviewing them too. If I remember uh, correctly, the documentary tells us that most of the production team were women. Oh yes, and Ellis Hazel knew that there were interesting women out there doing interesting things. This was the women's movement, you know, colliding with the anti-Vietnam movement, the civil rights movement. But, you know, in terms of feminism, I think Ellis was a feminist. He was always putting women first, black women first. But you didn't see that in a popular culture. No. You know, feminism wasn't for us when you think about it. And still there's a little bit of a division in contemporary um, times when you think of the women's movement and women's march. It's very divided. But he used that opportunity to not only say, let me put Nikki Giovanni out front. Let me... Let somebody else, Betty LeVette or, or Maya Angelou host the show, Toni Morrison. Toni example. Morrison, yeah. And that was extraordinary. That was revolutionary when you think about it. That's true black power for a man to say, go ahead and, yeah. and you be the muse. Novella Nelson, look at Giovanni. The people that were on this show were his muses in real life. But I think he saw the value in that and letting, let's say, Nikki Giovanni interviewed James Baldwin. Oh yes, go to London to do it. Oh, which is now a clip that went viral, you know, yeah. thanks to Amanda Seals. Um, she posted it on her Instagram and it got almost almost half a million views, likes, posts, and reposts. It was insane. And then Essence reposted it. How, how do you how do you suppose your uncle had a sense of who was going to make it or who was going to push through um, whatever ceiling and be a success. He seemed to have this knack. He did. He definitely had uh, an eye for yeah. people who were absolutely bound to be successful. And he yeah. knew that. And I, I, I don't know, it's a little bit uncanny, but he always knew. And he was somewhat of an Afrofuturist in that he always saw the better opportunity for artists. So, for example, perfect example is Astrid and Simpson. Oh. So they were songwriters. Yeah. They, were, they weren't really singer-songwriters. They were songwriters. They were literally hired by Motown, right, to, be, uh, to write for Tammy Terrell and Marvin Gaye. Oh, my goodness. And so that's what they did. But it was Ellis who said, no, you guys need to write your own material, one, and you need to perform it, too. And they said, we don't do that. We're not singers. Like, what are you talking about? And he's like, no, I'm going to give you a platform. Wasn't it the first show? They, 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 hadn't, they, had, they weren't, A, they weren't married, and B, they weren't, they hadn't even dropped an album yet together. That's how new it was. 
this was idea. Their, this was their first show. Yeah. So he gave them a whole hour. They changed clothes like five times. <laughs> Oh and they just did all their material, and they it was that moment when they became Ashford and Simpson. And they always talk about that, that Ellis saw something in them that they didn't see in themselves. And he was always doing that, whether it was, for example, a 15-year-old Arsenio Hall. He's like, that kid's going to be a star. But Arsenio, Arsenio was doing magic tricks. Gosh. We all know what happened to Arsenio, right? Yeah. Um, Tell now, me let me let me ask you about um oh in fact before I do that let me just um do this and say if you're just joining us my guest is an incredible woman who's made an incredible documentary I'm with Melissa Hayslip and she has created uh, a fabulous feature film documentary called Mr. Soul and it's about Ellis Hayslip so let me go back now let's talk about Ellis and his courage so as we learn in the documentary, he is a gay man and he has Louis Farrakhan on the show. Okay, first of all, my heart was beating so fast thinking, why would you do that? Or, you know, because it's very clear how M Minister Farrakhan feels about any kind of, well, outside of the norms that he considers norms. So sure enough, Louis Farrakhan was right there he uh, interviewed him and they talked about not the gay lifestyle, but being um, different. I mean, that is huge. That was huge. And it went well. <laughs> it went well. I mean, you had to be surprised when you saw that clip. You know, that still surprises me, that clip, because he was very smart in that he papered the house, if you will. He invited the entire nation of Islam, several mosques to come in and be the audience so that they would feel secure and so that Reverend uh, Minister Farrakhan, pardon me, Minister Farrakhan would feel secure and yeah. know that he was surrounded by his people. So that was a very smart move, first of all, because in a way it was like he was a minister and yeah. he was just preaching to his choir and he had that platform. Now what's interesting about that and there's so many levels of complexity to this because we all know that it, Farrakhan is rather controversial. Rather. And, um, yeah. Yes, that's, to be, that's the understatement of the year. <laughs> and although he is you know, very beloved by, um, by Islam and the nation of Islam, there are a lot of others who are not so happy with him and he's certainly known for being um, rather controversial. Yeah. And so the question for me was, well, is it my job to censor him and this story 50 years later? And I decided that I wasn't going to do that because I felt it was really important to show these levels of complexity yeah. as well. And to say, well, let's pick the most salient moment that's important to Ellis. It's not what he's saying about the nation and, and all of that. It's what what is specific to Ellis that is so revealing. And the fact that these two men would sit down and Ellis would take him to task yeah. about, uh, being, about the nation being notoriously homophobic and not accepting people uh, who were you know, same gender loving men and women or non-binary individuals. Yeah. Um, and for the, at the time, you have to understand that that was really controversial. Of course. For anything, let yeah. alone a black man talking with another you know, about this issue because we have our own issues. Uh, but, you know, Ellis was queer, and he was openly gay, and yeah. he wasn't apologizing for that. It was not something that he shared on the show, but just by his very presence and being able to have a successful show and, and promote artists, that was the accomplishment. So it was very brave of him to very brave. Yes. Brave man to sit there and... And I thought and courage, and he's going to be there. To engage this man to challenge him, really to talk about the nation of Islam and how they are or are not receptive to uh, the LGBT family. One of the poets uh, on the, the program, she called, well, at, this was uh, as she was being interviewed after the fact, but she called Ellis seditious. Seditious, yeah. Tell, tell me what was your reaction to that? Because I, I thought, well, 
I've never heard that as associated with a person, uh, the act of sedition, but she called him seditious. Well, let's see, what do you think the act of sedition is? Well, no, it's, it's you describe that? You know, rebel rouser being, you know, upsetting the the apple cart. I mean, just like yeah. shaking it up. And when that's she accurate. And I and I love how that's Sonia Sanchez, wonderful poet and uh, really a leader of the black arts movement and the uh, was the first poet laureate of Philadelphia, as a matter of fact, really? years ago. And uh, she's a remarkable woman and was performing on the show as well. And a really important part of our consulting team, she was mm -hmm. um, an academic advisor. For she looks show. like a, a sage. Yes, and she's also a professor. So oh, wow. she has so much to share. And I thought it was really interesting that she said that because it was very perceptive that she would say, you know, some people would say, oh, He's a very nice middle class man. And he, you know, he's he has lots of lovely guests and art and everything, but he's seditious. That whole show was seditious, and she's right. Yeah. And what he was trying to do was change minds and change the perception of African American culture. And in order to do that, you do have to push the envelope and you do have to push back at stereotypes and and frustrations and limitations. Mm -hmm. And I think by showing the broad spectrum of black art, black culture, black intellect, black love, you know, there was a lot to push against and a lot that was demanding us to almost redefine ourselves and, and demanding the audience to accept that. And to not have to um, apologize or, you know, say, well, this might be a little too much for you. So yeah. do you mind if, if, if I go in this corner and try to express myself, the show was all over the place. You yeah. know, I, I would say it was, it was undiluted. Yeah. It was absolutely in your face. And as Dr. Hayslip says on the show, that was its, that was its challenge and also its undoing. Well, yeah, we have to, we have to go there. Cause I, I was so sad um, about how that, came um, came uh, around uh, first of all the the Nixon um, element President Nixon and uh, his uh, obvious um, racism uh, or J Edgar Hoover I mean all of them you know get the show off the air you know what is it with all these black people and all that stuff so yeah. He had that working against him but he was a Renaissance man and the show was incredibly um, stylistic on the one hand and different yeah. and avant-garde and all of that. And then he finds out that the Corporation for Public Broadcasting did not include his show in their next year's budget and that the show's gonna go away. And I was surprised and I wonder what your feelings are. Why, as this one guy said, uh, why didn't you fight for it? Fight for it, Ellis, fight for it. And he said, if they haven't, if they haven't figured it out, you know, what we offer, you know, I got to let it go. Why, why did he go take that route as opposed to, you know, being seditious? Right. <laughs> yes. And I wanted to show that because it shows a duality in him. And I think that he, as, as well as many African-Americans, as we walk through the world, you know, we are always walking the line, whether it's how we present ourselves and who we really are, or, you know, our truthfulness, whether we're code switching at work and being different for our peers and our colleagues, or in Ellis's case where he was the gay black man, but he had to be, you know, kind of straight in order to appear to the audience, but without giving up the truth of who he was. Mm -hmm. And I think he had a sense that the show was very, very important. But at the same time, he knew that by fighting it, it wouldn't necessarily change anything. It's almost as if and one of the things he says in the quotes is sometimes it's necessary in the evolution of things to disappear. Let it disappear. Yeah. The notion that perhaps you have to take something that's so good away before people will recognize, recognize how important it was and how significant it was and what it meant to the culture. And ironically, I now feel like after 50 years, and today we have a big article in the New York Times talking about the significance of this show and that was 50 years ago, and they're finally recognizing it. And perhaps that is part of the greater 
um, you know, movement that we're in right now and we've had more time to reflect as we sit at home and, and shelter at home. But well, Melissa we recognized that. Melissa, there was no copycat. There, there hasn't been anything like it since 1973. That's true. How is that possible? I mean, the Oprah Winfrey show, a black woman, um, she's uh, running her own show and then eventually she buys you know, the rights to her show. And I have spent many years uh, freelancing for the Oprah show and you know, oh, going all over the place. Yeah, but it still wasn't a black centric show. So, yeah. you know, and I think a lot has changed too since that time. And with the onset of um, commercialism and commercializing um, and commodifying talent and content with the, I don't want to get too dark or anything, uh, but you know, how the appropriation of talent and content and stories. Misappropriation. And misappropriation, <laughs> right? And all of that having to be supported by commercialism yeah. and the, you know the buy-in of ads, ad supporting content. It's not as innocent as it used to be. And I think the beauty of this show, the fact that it was on public television and supported by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and also uh, big um, foundations like the Ford Foundation, that gave it a certain amount of freedom that it needed to have. Yeah. And when we look back, we can say, oh, thank God. You know, when you look at Channel 13, uh, the, the station, or when you look at the Ford Foundation, you say, thank you. Yeah. Because you guys were, you know, were the, the instigators of, of, this, of keeping this on the air. And so the problem is that, and to answer your question earlier about the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, yes, they were funding the show, but imagine because that is, public funding, it goes all the way up. Yes, it does. So if you're having trouble, you know, at the senior level, which is our administration deciding what gets publicly funded, that's going to trickle down. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm sure Ellis was absolutely right if he felt that there was a conspiracy to get all black programming off the air, because at the time there were only two shows. Tony Brown's Journal, which was then called Black Journal. Oh, so that's right. Oh, right. I that's that. it. And yeah. so that's pretty remarkable. Now, Tony Brown Journal is still on after all these years, and I guess they chose one to stay. <laughs> but, oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's very interesting, and the times have changed so much. And it's hard to say, but I really hope that with our film, you know, to end on a positive note, bringing attention to this wonderful archive and giving people the freedom to celebrate themselves, that it will... Um, Bring up new interest in the series. And Absolutely. Or, or just give us I'm, a chance to see this. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still trying to figure out, how come I didn't know about this show? Um, before I let you go, tell me if you would, or share with us if you would, some advice for future filmmakers or, or perhaps a filmmaker who's in the midst of trying to figure out the pitch and the sizzle reel and you know, your your uh, legacy or, or your credits are so extensive, but it didn't happen for you overnight. This oh. project, you said, is 10 years in the making. So best advice, like, you know, chin up and you can do it, or, or what would you say to give someone inspiration to stay with it? Absolutely. The most inspiring thing I would say is that when you have a great idea, believe in that idea. All great things start from an idea. And especially when you look at our film, Mr. Soul, it started with an idea and nothing else. No money, no secret you know, financiers in the corner, no support at all, and certainly nothing that would make you realize, oh, that's going to happen right away. <laughs> so, but you have to start with an idea and build on that idea and believe in that idea and then find the allies who will help make that idea a reality. That might be as small as building your team, or it might actually be, you know, finding allies and organizations that are like-minded, like Black Public Media helping us. But always to start small and believe in that truth, and know that our stories matter. You know, we're out there championing for Black Lives Matter, but also Black stories matter, and telling Black stories matters, and being the ones to tell your own story matters. And so there's like all these layers to that, and I would encourage any
Oh, I hope I didn't. <laughs> I said to recognize um, that you have whatever you're passionate about and tell that story. Because if you are going to be living with it for 10 years, like I did, you want to make sure that that is the path, that the passion will drive you through the good times and the bad times. Well, you birthed a little baby, a 10 year old baby. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's essentially what you did. It's an old baby, but I well, think the timing yeah. is perfect because oh, of the timing yeah. of the end, especially. Yeah. The timing is. Melissa, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed this. I've already watched it twice. Oh. <laughs> I, I enjoyed every every minute. And then reading about your background, I, I just cannot tell you how impressive you are, but you are following your dream and bringing this show to, you know, to, to light. I mean, get, essentially, you know, pulling the covers off. Mm -hmm. Something that ended in 1973, began in 1968, and it's like, what? There's Toni Morrison, her first show, and Simpson and Ashford, and Al Green. I mean, it just goes on and on, and the, and the modern dancing, and the guy playing three trumpets, at, or three sax at the same time. And anyway, it's, it's an amazing legacy that you are personally a part of, but also the legacy that you're showing um, sharing with us that as black folks, I mean, we have so much to be proud of. And we have so much to be proud of. And I'd like to say that you. my favorite part of the film and something that was said on the last show in 1960, 1973 That's is right. that although it's over, it's not the end. Yeah. Black seeds keep on growing. And that is really, really important that we do keep on growing, that we do keep on sprouting, whether it's our ideas or you know, pushing forward into the culture leading yeah. into the culture, it's not the end. It's never the end. And I like to think that even with the end of Soul, it was just the beginning. It, and I think Ellis knew that. And he said, well, we have to take it to the next level. And I'm happy to go back in time to do that. But really, it's about what comes next. I think there will be a next for sure once people get to see this film. Uh, it just, I mean, it can't just... Be like, oh, that was nice. Oh, this is going to energize like nobody's business. Which well, is let me tell you how you can see it. We have time to just yes, yes. Out. Okay, so we're doing something new, which is for the times, and especially because we're in this time when we're all at home, we're having a virtual release of the film. So it will be in thirty, uh, in oh, actually over fifty-one theaters mm -hmm. around the country that we're partnering with that are actually having a virtual cinema. So if you have a favorite theater that you like, all you have to do is go onto our website, mrsoulmovie.com, and go to the screenings tab. And then you can look and see the list of all the theaters that we have, some near you possibly. Great. And then you can choose the theater you want to support. Just click on that, and yeah. then you can watch the film. Oh, that's so great. Don't wait. And if you have 72 hours to watch it, and I think you have a week before, like when, once you buy your tickets. Well, you only have 72 hours once you unlock it. Well, but we wanted to do something that would support independent cinema, and also it gives you a chance to support, you know, independent filmmakers and black filmmakers and black film. So it's a win-win for everybody. It is a win-win, and, and we, we will have a couple of drive-ins too. <laughs> oh wow! I didn't know that. Well, thank you. This yeah. is surely, truly a special edition of Soul Talk with you, Melissa Hayslip, you. as our guest. Thank you, and congratulations on Mr. Soul. Thank you. And don't forget to follow us at Mr. Soul the Movie. Mr. Soul Movie dot com. Yes. And follow us at, at Mr. Soul the Movie on Instagram, okay. Twitter, and Facebook. Oh, oh, good. Thank you. Thanks so much, Melissa. Thank you. All right. Let me share with you before we say goodbye a few announcements. On September 13th, Soul Talk will feature uh, guest poet Nikki Finney. She was born uh, by the sea in South Carolina and raised during the civil rights, black power and black arts movement, Nikki Finney, September 13th. She is a national book award winner for her work titled uh, Head Off and Soul, or sorry, Head Off and Split. And she's written a new book this year called Love Child's Hotbed of Occasional Poetry. Did you get all that? And let's see. I want to encourage you, of course, to subscribe to DBFF on social media. We have a website, I mean, um, Facebook page and a YouTube channel. Uh, let's see. Also Twitter. 
we have watch parties on Twitter. And uh, let's see. Oh, and IG Live. Uh, let's talk about it on IG Live. So that's a lot of social media. Every social media connection you can think of, we're part of it, DVFF. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on this special edition of Soul Talk with Melissa Hayslip. And DVFF, the festival itself, is going to be January 27th through the 31st of 2021. I know we all want to be done with 2020, and we will be. And we also want to thank our sponsor, KXAS-TV, Texas Connexus. I'm Michelle Redmond. I hope you have a great day.